What's up, guys? John and Travis here with another fantastic episode of Elvis Tight Podcast. John, how was that? Man, that's got to be one of my favorite ones. I got to tell you, that was a lot of fun. It Time freaking just flew by in this episode, man. We have Matt Wallstrom. 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 Man, I freaking almost said it wrong. You, you got to think too. of the Clippers, man. Yeah, like the Wall Clippers and then strumming Strong. guitar yes, is yes, what, literally yes. what he just said. Yes. So, <laughs> but we have Matt Wallstrom. He is the owner of Epic Roll BJJ, uh, Brash Guards, Geese, Lifestyle Wear. Big entrepreneur. Big entrepreneur. And man, what a great freaking episode. When you, If you guys ever talk to people you know when you have those conversations where you walk away and you're just like enlightened you just feel i, I don't know not not necessarily like we're smarter and yeah, like, just it, somebody it, worth meeting it's just yeah it, uh, gr- what a great way to put it like matt is just someone worth meeting like talking to him his his journey his business like it was it was just great to talk to him have a conversation with him it was very very good so uh if you guys enjoy this episode please let us know he's his i don't even I, i'm like at a loss for words it's just good if, you, <laughs> if that's honestly it. john what was some of the stuff we covered though man we talked about everything we talked about uh jiu-jitsu um where you're at in your belt level how long you've been there we talked about uh some local stuff uh towards the end of the podcast uh some stuff in our area about self-defense and what might benefit you what might not uh lots of stuff we talked about yeah it's really good it's one of our longer episodes lately too so hopefully you guys enjoy it and listen to the whole thing what is our beverage of the day though jonathan we had a silver city wonderland winter lager you want to mm. show it to the camera there it was delicious it was a little bit over seven percent i enjoyed it i thought it was pretty smooth i literally drank the whole oh you drank the whole thing too oh, i'm oh, feeling yeah, a little sure. tipsy so i was actually like man i'm already out <laughs> yeah, and honestly, too. It's a long conversation. So I didn't think that I thought the beer was going to last the whole time, but usually yeah. we only go for like an hour. This is yeah. close to two hours. Over, yeah, yeah, close to two hours. Well, we talk afterwards, too, yeah. but yeah. what you guys won't hear. And we got some juicy details on this episode. So hopefully you guys enjoy that, too. But uh, if you guys want to follow Matt and Epic Roll BJJ, everything's going to be down in the description below. Um, make sure you give him a follow. Go check out his gear. It is grappling gear for grapplers, which is like the biggest thing. How many people out there are in a company that actually don't grapple or whatever? It's it's Matt does everything for the company, so it's it's super super good. Um, and then like always, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook, Elbows Tight Podcast, Elbows Tight Pod everywhere, Elbows Tight Check out our holiday gift guide. Christmas is right around the corner if you're watching this when it comes out. Christmas is right around the corner. So if you want to get some last-minute Christmas gifts, go watch our nine gifts for your beginning grappler over on YouTube. And uh, I think that's pretty much it. I think that's it. So you guys have a good night. John's got to get out of here. He's about to get in trouble. So I'm probably in trouble. <laughs> so you guys have a good night. Thank you so much for watching. All right. Talk to you later, guys. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Elbows Tight Podcast. It's your host, Travis and John. John, how are you doing today? I'm doing real good, man. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic. We have a wonderful beer today that I cannot wait to share with you guys. John, where'd you get this from? Uh, my wife was gracious enough to pick it up for, for both of us. We wanted oh, it to be man. an epic podcast today. So we got, we got an epic reason to have an epic <laughs> podcast today. So- <laughs> I like what you did there. I like what you did. <laughs> so our guest today is uh, the owner, CEO, and Brown Belt. Matt Wallstrom, how you doing today, Matt? I got it right. I'm so good, man. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, absolutely, you did. You nailed it. I was like, I started we, for we a second in my head. I was like, you did. I thought you nailed it. I was like, uh, don't don't act like I don't know how to say it. We just went over. <laughs> so <laughs> so like, how you doing, today, Matt? How do we remember? <laughs> I'm I'm good, brother. I'm good. Thank you. Hey, Thank uh, you. so before we go any further, let's go ahead and get into your beverage of the day. What do you What do you got in that cup? I saw it looked like a beer. I. You did. It's it's a beer. Um, a buddy of mine told me about this drink. He went to OU uh, University in Oklahoma, and he they used to drink these. Uh, it was Stella beer, mm-hmm. but they put just a little bit of Rose's lime juice in the bottom. Oh. Of it. Stir it up, and I'm going to tell you something. It sounds ridiculous, and it sounds mildly feminine, but it's very refreshing. <laughs> it's like a great, it's just a good, it kind of, I mean, Stella's great by itself, but you put a little of that Rose's lime juice in it. Try it out. Is it like a Corona you know with I mean? lime Try now? It or? It's, it's not, it's like a little, um, 
little tangy. It's got like that sort of summer shandy. Oh, okay. okay. You know yeah, what right. I mean? Just like really crisp, refreshing, yeah. easy, kind of like, you know. It's a man that drinks I don't beer. usually ask for it when I go out to to like restaurants because I just feel a little too weird oh ordering my it. Gosh. I'm like, could I get just a third of an ounce of Rose's lime juice? You know what I mean? <laughs> no, I no, I, I just leave it. Alone, I get it, man. Know? I I uh, had a uh, a Corona with a lime last night, and I thought it was fantastic. I was like, holy crap! I forgot how good a Corona with a lime. It's so simple. It's a light beer, but it is so good. You know, and now and now, John, why don't you go ahead and what, what do we tell tell Matt what we got over here? We're drinking a Silver City Wonderland Winter. It, I mean, it's dark. It's a good seven percent. Yeah, I don't know if you can see uh, that. Now man. the camera's moved on us. I don't know where I'm pointing anymore. You just point, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Matt, do you prefer like uh, Hefeweizens, blondes, or like are you like a thicker stout or Ambers, IPA kind of maybe guy? An Amber. Ambers. Like, what what's your kind of beer of choice? Yeah, like I'm a big Mexican beer. Yeah, yeah. you know Dos what I mean. He's Modelo. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Modelo Negro. Like that's like uh, I think that's kind of my jam. Um, uh, more than I feel like the the darker beers is kind of like a seasonal thing. Like I could I could go I can get down with that like in the winter. You know what yeah. I mean? Getting like a little bit of a thicker beer. The one thing that I've never gotten behind and it's just it's it's a it's like i don't like mint chocolate chip ice cream either and mm. i'm like one of you know three you people i know what you know what i mean mm. like i know can't be Bro, perfect. it's like i hate it actually it's not even i don't like it but, <laughs> it's um, not even i don't like it i like, absolutely hate yeah. it yeah but like ipas i just <sighs> i never you know what i mean like and that's like that's like the gentleman's beer. Like everybody talks about them. They've all, you know, yeah. there's 411,000 companies that make them now and everybody's trading them on the black market. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> I, but, I, but I, I just, I can't, you know what I mean? I'm like, uh, I'm like, just give me, uh, dude, just give me a Corona and a lime. Bro, I'm with you. Good. I'm with you. I think we used to be the same. Like I was the same. I couldn't drink them. I drink one and it was like, I was baking a loaf of bread in my yeah. stomach. I was like, can't do these things. But now I've learned I can do them. I just look for the ones that have the smallest IBU rating. The higher the rating, the worse they taste. Yeah. You don't, did you say what's the IBU? It's the International yeah, Bitterness that? Units. Yeah. So like a double stout has like a lot of IBUs. So it's got like that real hoppy flavor to it. Yeah, you're yeah. sucking on a pine cone. Yeah. I'm not much for those. <laughs> right. Hate it. Hate it. Yeah. yeah no, I, I, when I first started drinking IPAs, to, kind of like to your point, I was like, these are terrible. How are people <laughs> like in love with these? And now I kind of like went back around to it. Like I had like a big IPA kick for a while. And now I'm kind of like, I go into the grocery store and I'm like, oh, so half the grocery store is IPAs. And then there's a blonde a hef you know what i mean it's like okay well i guess i'll go back to the last week we had or last episode we had cores yeah i was like i just want something light you know what i mean like i'm not trying it's been a long time since we had water on the podcast it was, it was pretty yeah, good was, i actually felt more hydrated Dasani and they were out of Dasani, yeah. so i get it <laughs> i was like fuji water this is great man <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. so hey matt well uh enough about beer i mean i could talk about it all day because i love it so much but we really want to get to know you a little bit more can you go ahead and give us a, a backstory of how you got into jujitsu and whatnot yeah, so I started jiu-jitsu in 2005. Um, I did taekwondo growing up. I grew up in Southern California, and I did taekwondo growing up, and I feel like every kid, you know, did at one point or another. And something happened, like when I got a little bit older, I think I came to the conclusion that self-defense as a life skill didn't, it was like a non-negotiable, you know what I mean? Like it just seemed like something you needed to have. I was getting married and having my first son. And um, around that time, I think was when the Ultimate Fighter was kind of getting out and uh, was kind of getting popular. And so I kind of saw jujitsu. I saw this, you know, this thing. I didn't really know too much about it, but I, at the time I was doing graphic design and web design. And um, so I Googled like, you know, jiu-jitsu schools and the school that had the best website i was like well clearly that's the right choice because they have a decent website so they know what they're doing <laughs> obviously that's the only credentials that they need um and i went and it was a different time for sure because it was very much the old school jiu-jitsu like you know kind of beat the shit out of you like relentlessly like now we're very nice to people when they come in and we're very accommodating and here's how it's going to be. And you're going to hit plateaus. And we go through all the ins and outs, you know, really to integrate people the right way, which I think is a really great thing to do. Um, but it wasn't really like that for me. It was kind of just like hop in. And if you don't die, then congratulations. <laughs> and, um, 
And so I started doing it. Uh, I did it for about a year. And then I decided, hey, I want to get into MMA. Um, Not because I wanted a career in it, but because I had never really been in a fight before. And at that point, I thought, you know, getting into a bar fight and beating somebody, especially when you're training, doesn't seem that impressive. Getting in the ring with somebody who's another trained fighter and beating them sounds a little bit more of a challenge and a little bit more impressive and a little bit more exciting. So my jujitsu... Coach at the time told me to do one more year of of uh, jujitsu and get like a you know really solid foundation in it. So I did. So I was a white belt for two years and got my blue belt like the day before I had my first MMA fight okay. and had four fights, which I had like a three and one record. I lost one fight to a, a, a state champion wrestler. I lost on uh, decision on points. Um, so it was good advice. <laughs> it was good advice to do jujitsu and get that solid foundation. Um, but yeah, that that really kind of kick started it, and like I said, it's been 16 years now that I've been training. So, did you feel a little extra pressure getting a blue belt right before you, you got in there? I think it maybe gave me a little extra confidence. Yeah, right? <laughs> like I no. got this. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I kind of did. Like, and the guy that I fought was his whole little camp of people were they were mean mugging everybody, and they were oh, no. Uh, Oh yeah. They were like heckling people, just like assholes, you know I mean? They just, they were. And so I was like, all right, like I got this. And I, I went in and, you know, I, I beat him in the first round. The ref stopped it. You know, he just wasn't defending himself from punches and strikes, but, um, but yeah, that felt good. That felt good to do that. But I do remember when, when I got in the ring and I'm like looking around And there's all these people and I'm standing in there and I'm looking down at my feet and then the bell rings and I'm like watching my feet walk forward on this. (laughs) And all in my head is I'm just like, what in the fuck am I doing? Like, what am I doing right now? Like, you know what I mean? Like, this is crazy. Uh, But then, you know, it's like sink or swim, right? Like somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. And so you just kind of, it's that like fight or flight, you know, you just go after it. So um, it was cool. I was, I'm glad that I did it. It was a, I think it was a cool experience. I think it takes, you know, for anybody to go and get in the ring, I think it takes uh, a level of commitment and, you know, yeah. uh, being able to be humbled if you know, because it's like, you're kind of putting yourself out there. Yeah. One, Same with jiu-jitsu. one of our good friends, he actually, uh, he's a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and he did two amateur MMA fights already. He's zero and two. But that's not to say anything towards it. You know what I mean? Like he he the, his second yeah. fight he lost TKO. He he got rocked and he's like, oh crap. He said he's like he's like I wasn't expecting the guy to hit that hard because he's like 125, 135 pounds. He's like, but yeah, he he rocked me really good. But beforehand he was talking about. I was like, what what is what are you most excited about going into like your first MMA fight? He's like, I really just want to kick someone as hard as possible. He's like, I want to know what that feels like to just <laughs> lay into someone with a kick. What were you most excited about going into that first MMA fight? Man, I don't, I, I don't know if it was just like, I kind of in my, my life has always had these big audacious goals kind of set, you know, sporadically throughout just, you know, my, just the life. And so it was kind of another, one of those maybe personal milestones, like little, you know, just little things that I wanted to do for me. I wanted to test myself. It's, you know, there's some level of just barbaric, you know, like just something that's in our DNA. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, from our ancestors and that, that whole, that whole side of it, there's just something very primal about it. And, uh, and to be able to do it, I think in a controlled setting where it's like, it's nice to experience that, but I don't want to go out into the street and get into a street fight and have somebody get killed and have some crazy stuff happen and end up in jail. It's like, you know what I mean? Like just within reason, but, um, it's, I think you also learn a lot about yourself and like, you you know, perspective of just life and, and what you do under duress and in these kind of situations, there's a lot that like kind of goes into that and a lot that can test you as like a human being. So, I think it was just something kind of exhilarating from that standpoint of just a challenge, you know? Yeah, I'm listening to Hicks and Gracie's uh, Breathe right now, Life and Flow. And if you guys haven't listened to it, it's, it's a great book. It's it's him, like, re, re, remembering the beginning days of, like, Valetudos and, like, MMA and whatnot. And one thing he talks about, too, is, like, uh, when when people first started, like, 
jujitsu getting popularized, he realized what was happening was there was what he called a lot of paper tigers, right? People that were saying, you know, oh, I train, I, this and that. But at the end of the day, they probably wouldn't actually ever get into a fight and then use it as to where, you know, back in the early 2000s, especially people that grew up in the 90s in jujitsu, it was completely different, right? It was fighting was a normal thing, like hard training practice. Like you mentioned, like you got your butt kicked and in practice and whatnot. And, and now that's definitely changed for good and bad, right? Like it's a whole, it's better for business, not having people, right. people walk in and <laughs> getting their butt kicked day one. You know what I mean? So when you were a white belt coming from Taekwondo, what, what was the biggest eye opener from, for you? I think it was the, I, I had never experienced that level of physical control from like another human, like something where you just, you recognize how vulnerable you truly are when you grapple with somebody who's like an advanced grappler, say just even like purple belt, you know, like, and you're a white belt and you feel that, and you can even see it in, you know, whether they're big or strong, you just, you feel their pressure. You feel like that technique and, and, you know, everything that you thought to do, they were three steps ahead of you in that thought process and set you up for 10 other things. It's just, it's like a sinking <laughs> ship that you just can't get out of, you know what yeah. I mean? And, uh, and so when you, it's hard to, it's hard to, I think, understand that without experiencing it, right? You can explain it to somebody and you can talk about it, but until you've had somebody sitting on top of you, sucking the life out of you with their pressure and you can't breathe and, you know, you, you feel like you're about to pass out and all, you know, this, this type of like stress and, um, pressure. It's very, you know, yeah, it's very eye opening. So I, I think once I, once I saw that, I was like, wow, this is like, you know, the cliche, like it's like a superpower. It's yeah. just like a thing that you, you, when you learn this and then man, and then when you get really good, you learn how to apply it like gently, you know, and, and just almost to an insulting level because <laughs> it's so gentle that it just, you don't even know what's happening. And next thing you know, you're like tapping out. So it's a beautiful thing. It just, it, it was, it was, unlike any other martial art that I had seen or experienced. And I, I think I quickly recognized how it also seemed like a very practical form of martial arts to study and give my time to. Like, I think there's definitely value in striking um, and understanding takedowns, you know, having, having some wrestling and, and being well-rounded, right? If you, if you want to be a, a complete fighter, there's aspects of it. It's not just jiu-jitsu, but there are some really great, you know, things with jiu-jitsu that, that you can use to protect yourself without risking some, you know, severe injuries to people that in the real world can cause a lot more problems than just the little argument that you had at IHOP that now somebody's like in jail. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, it's just kind of not worth it. So it's nice to have that in your pocket. So I think when I saw that, I just instantly became addicted to that idea and that notion of like, I gotta, I gotta learn this. Yeah. It's, it's funny you mentioned that too, because I definitely feel you know, there was the the joke going around with Jocko and Joe Rogan in their their recent episode where it's like people talk about like, oh, what would you do if you got in a fight or like you train or anything like that? Nah, bro, I just see red and you know that's it. It's like you know when it comes down to it, you you could say that, but against someone with just a little bit of training, it make it makes a huge difference. You know, especially when you're a white belt and you you feel that pressure, you feel that control. You're sitting there like, holy crap, man, like. What am I supposed to do? You get a neon belly. That first time you get a neon belly and you're like, my, I'm, my soul's in the mat. I'm just going to go ahead and just die here. You know what I mean? Like when you first started, what was what was the 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 one kryptonite to you? For me, neon belly. One, 100%. I, I had no idea. Once someone went a solid neon belly on me, I was like, I don't know what to do from here. Like I can't even think because I'm so freaking uncomfortable. What was that one thing for you? So one of my early instructors who I end up having a school with who's still a very dear friend of mine is um, uh, this guy, Salvatore Sanguinetti, who's actually Kenny Florian's cousin. And oh, wow. so, um, and we, so I got to train with him a lot and we, and, and this guy is, you know, 140 pounds wet. And I, I would almost agree with you because one of the things that I just remember most vividly is his neon belly pressure. And I remember being so like confused because I was, you know, like 185 pounds. Like I, just, I literally, I was like, I'm confused. I'm laughing because I was, the, I was there with yeah. you. <laughs> It doesn't like, it's not red. I'm like, you're light as shit, dude. Like I, you're like the, you're like a heavy backpack. And, and yet when you, and yet when you are, have your knee on my stomach, I feel like you're 300 pounds and I don't know, 
you know, and then I push your knee and then you're in mount and then you're choking me out. So it's just, yeah, I, I think, I think that's, that's one that I definitely remember too is neon belly. I learned how to fix that real quick. <laughs> so how long did it take you before you, you overcame the, the pressure, like the, cause a lot of people, once you get, you, you, you feel that pressure when you first start, how long until you became comfortable in the uncomfortable? I, I made a point of, and I don't really know why I recognized it. I don't remember anybody necessarily telling me this, but it kind of made sense to me that I, I really early on tried to roll almost exclusively with like higher belts. Mm. Um, because like the ego, you roll with other white belts, right? Cause you want to go home a winner once in a while. You'd like to, <laughs> it's nice to, I still do it's it. nice to also submit people, you know, like, um, sucks to get your ass beat all the time over and over and over again. But when you roll with higher belts, you're typically getting put in situations that, you know, lower belts would not put you in. You're, they're typically going to be a little bit more, you know, they're not going to be spazzy white belts, right? Like they're going to be a little bit more, uh, usually calm and, and composed. They'll usually go over. I always made a point of like asking these higher belts after we rolled, you know, how did I do? What did I screw up on? What I, so I, I, I saw the value in that and then I made those people my target. So it, I think that helped me um, move forward a little bit quicker in the beginning because I just started to go, well, this isn't necessarily just about the ego of me wanting to like submit another white belt. It's like, let me get in there and roll with like purple and brown and black belts. And so that I'm learning these. So I felt like my proficiency for from a defensive standpoint was really elevated from from taking that approach. Neon belly, huh? You know what it was for me was just pure pressure. When they get yeah. that mountain, they get the hooks in. I thought I was suffocating to death. And what what finally for me what it was is I just looked at other people and I was like, nobody else is tapping the pressure. I was like, that's it. I'm no longer tapping to this. <laughs> and that's how I got over that hump <laughs> until California. And it was a good 400 pounder. That pressure was for real. Yeah, there's there's <laughs> a big difference between you know like a blue belt pressure and a black belt pressure. Like rolling with my my professor when we first started rolling you know he he got i thought i was used to pressure i thought i was used to neon belly you know because i've been doing jujitsu a couple years now uh no no <laughs> he he put he like redefined it for me again i was like what is in the world is this like yeah. wizardry you are doing to me right now so when you in your first school what what how many black belts did you guys have in a typical class Okay. This is, and this is really what I, I tell a lot of people now that I train with at our school, because we have such a high amount of, of, um, color belts at the school. But when I started, we had one, two purple belts, one black belt, some blue belts, the rest white belts. I had this group. It was actually pretty amazing. Um, I have this photo of, my first, you know, like your first group of people that you start jiu jitsu yep, with. Yep. It was like, right. And we used to be at this little gold's gym. Um, and, uh, in like the group X studio and would roll out the mats. And, um, and in that photo today, almost all of those guys, except for like very few kept going and got their black belt. Like all of us got to that level of jujitsu, which is amazing because in, in general, like you see such a higher attrition ratio of people like that don't actually get to a black belt level. Mm -hmm. Um, and these guys did. So it was very cool, um, having these guys all, and they're like all running their own schools in the area. And we're all like really good friends. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Um, so we did not have that many at, at all. Um, my school now silverback, uh, in Chantilly, Virginia, it's, a Tom de Blast school. So hmm. my, my instructor's right under Tom de Blast and, um, he's actually coming down next month to, uh, to hang out with us and we're doing some black belt promotions, which are going to be awesome. Um, and, uh, so our school, we have, you know, like just the other day, Wednesday noon class, we had like seven brown belts on the mat, three black belts, like seven or eight purple belts. I mean, it's, it, I like the people that get to train it at this school starting out. I'm like, you don't even understand how valuable this oh, is man. to have. You're talking 25 to 35 people on the mats at, at almost every single class. Um, you know, afternoon, evening, and even like decent classes in the morning. 
um, and all these like higher belts, you know what I mean? Like a ton, like after this, this promotion that's coming up, we'll have close to 10 active black belts wow. at the school, you know, that are rolling with people. And like, these aren't just hurt old ass black belts that sit over on the side and make fun of people. These are like the black belts that are actually out on the mats rolling with everybody. I got to, I got to experience that. Um, what you said, uh, we have uh, one black belt in one. our school and a couple purples. Uh, no, no purples, two brown, two, no yeah, purples. Yeah. And then blues and whites. Uh, and it's pretty much always been this way. When I went and worked in San Diego, the gym I was going to, it was full of black belts, brown belts. And it was amazing. Like when we'd roll, even like, uh, it was just nice. If somebody saw me doing something wrong, they'd just come over right away. They'd fix it. They'd walk me through it. I was like, man, this was sweet. Like, you know, it'll be nice when we get, you know, that kind of build where we're at. But I, I definitely appreciated it and liked it when I was down in California. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Like it's, it's so fascinating because I feel like when you have such a high skill ceiling in the gym, the skill, uh, the skill base is higher also. You know what I mean? Like your white belts in, in my eyes are already that much higher because there's more skill, there's more technique or there's more experience. That's the word I'm looking for. There's more experience for them to come over and help you out. We've only had, always had just one black belt in our school. So whenever we have like a visiting black belt, we're like, oh my God, like smash me, smash me. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah, I'm like, don't take it easy. Yeah, yeah, just yeah, crush yeah. me. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, come on. I, I need, I, I got to experience something new. We had a Nathan Orchard uh, come through and did a seminar in our school and there, man, it is just a world of difference between like a black belt that trains and then a black belt that is, you know, a world renowned, like does it for a living because I, I, I can, I couldn't explain. It's like a Marvel character yeah. that came in there wearing a gi <laughs> and just destroyed the, I, I was know. like, are you kidding me right now? Did he just tap like 15 times in 30 seconds? I was like, I, that was amazing. I, I, I was like... <laughs> I was like, this is this is crazy how good he is. I, I I can't wait to be, you know, a half of that that level or whatnot. So you do you get to travel a lot for work, uh, since you own Epic Roll? I, I do. Um and you know, Epic Roll is a a side hustle that turned into a second full time job. I'm I'm a real estate agent oh, nice. and real estate investor. Um that's my full-time gig um so i'm licensed in dc virginia and maryland i have a team with my wife and so we've been doing that for about almost eight years um and uh so yeah i love that it's a great industry but um epic roll started and as it has evolved yeah in the past three years um since i started it it went from you know drop shipping some t-shirt designs to you know, sponsoring like huge athletes and tournaments and working with like amazing companies and people now doing, you know, uh, collaboration projects. And so, um, yeah, I do, I get to, to, to travel quite a bit for that. And, um, and I always train whenever I travel, you know what I mean? So like I have a school in Hawaii, um, uh, Kavrina's school in, in Oahu that I've been going to for the past almost, almost 10 years, you know what I mean? Since I was like a purple belt and, uh, that's like my Hawaii school. It's so cool. You know what I mean? I've got my school in, in Orlando, Florida, um, that I go down to and train, um, Elementum. And so there's a, yeah, it's, it's very cool. I get to travel and train. And that's like one of the best parts about that is, is the people I've, I've been fortunate enough to connect with and, and meet and work with now. It's, it's pretty amazing. So when you travel to these other schools for work or since you're there in town, is there like a grace period of where you have to get used to the way these people roll? Like, cause you're used to the people at your school or is it kind of like you've been there so many times you, you already, you know who to roll with and, and how they roll. It, you know, it's always, I, I usually always have a target on my back. Right. Like, and, and so no matter what, like there are some people that I know that are at these schools, but there's always people that I don't know and they, and they don't know me and they just see this, you know, this new dude. And so, um, some schools they go, you know, gangbusters at this point, like I, I kind of let people dictate the pace of the jujitsu. I'm very respectful when I go to people's mm -hmm. gyms. Like I, I don't go in to try to be, you know, like to like prove anything or whatever. And, you know, at the end of the day, like my jujitsu is good enough that even if I needed to, to be very defensive against like, you know, a really aggressive black belt or something like that's fine. I can do that. It's just, I kind of let them push that, you know, because some people are, 
a lot of, well, I mean, I do come across a lot of people that are willing to like listen and they want to, they want more advice more than they just want to try to beat the, you know, the brown belt or the black belt. Like they, you know, um, so yeah, so I, I, I usually everybody's very cool. Um, but it's always tough. Like, right. You can't just like pop in and like slide in like unnoticed. Like most <laughs> of these schools I go to, I'm like, I'm like the highest student that's in that class if you know, or, or what's going So it's like, you can't just, you just have to be accepting of that, but our school and, and the philosophy is that we, you know, don't promote people, uh, when they can be promoted, right? Because if you were to promote somebody to say a purple belt and then they go to some school and they go in there you never want them to go in with this mindset like I'm a oh I just got my purple belt like I'm a one week purple belt you know versus the guy that's been a purple belt for six months or whatever like if you're a purple belt you're a purple right. belt you know what I mean and you're expected to 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 operate at a purple belt level um, and it's not and it's to you know it's to give everybody their own confidence in that right like you want to go in and I I wouldn't want to go in and be like like a just the mindset of like a new purple belt you know what I mean like I'm a purple belt and so I'm gonna <laughs> you know, I'm going to train that purple. So that's really like kind of what we cultivate and, and sort of, uh, make sure that we, we have people at those levels because man, I don't know if you guys have experienced it or not yet, but I mean, there are, there are for sure levels of, of black belts and, and as you know, long as the, the industry continues to grow, um, and more and more schools pop up, it, it wouldn't be weird to to think that perhaps that might water things down in terms of some type of quality and, and, you know, quality assurance and like making sure everything's up to certain standards. You get some kind of like random place in South Dakota that's training it. They're like, yeah, there were, we're brown belt or black belt. It's like a very different brown or black belt than like what you might find in San Diego. We, right. right. I think we totally Miami. understand that. We, we used to have one that would come through the gym pretty frequently and all of us were un unsure if that was legit or not. But you can't really ask, so we didn't. <laughs> but I was like, especially a, a no. But it's like you don't want to be that yeah. guy. You, you know don't want to be a blue belt. Be like, like are you really a black belt? Yeah. <laughs> but the 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 fact that we were just wondering, we were like, uh, yeah. and we weren't the only ones wondering. So yeah, our professor like, actually rolled with him, right? And uh, the guy was talking about how he's a Carlson Gracie Junior black belt and this and that. And he's like, and our professor was like, oh, really? He's like, he has the bulldogs tattooed on his chest, right? That's like he's like. Third, Commitment. yeah, he's like third generation black belt, right? <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, really? Me too." And he like opens up his gi, and the guy was like, mm. "Like, <laughs> he's like, he's like, do you know this person?" He's like, "Oh, I don't, I don't know that person." He's like, "Oh, it's a pretty, pretty prominent person within within the Carlson school." Like, and he's like, he never came back after that. <laughs> like, <laughs> have, have you ran into uh, so? I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a black belt, but like yeah. someone that you're like, I don't, mm, come on, bro, like you could be oh, honest with 100%. me, one hundred percent, yeah. Oh yeah, we have. I mean, we have people coming through our, our school quite a bit. I mean, we had a, dude. We had a. We had like a one of our blue belts tapping out a black belt. I, yeah, and this wasn't like a four hundred pound blue belt and a twelve pound black belt. You know <laughs> what I mean? This was like two normal ass human beings that just the black belt jujitsu was. You know, not black belt jujitsu, man. It's just I. I don't know that to me like. The belt is there, but your jujitsu is your jujitsu. Right. There's and no fake. So that. there's really not. And and I think the best thing people can do is is work on building up their confidence through their competency, you know, and, and really just taking that approach because I mean, I'm you know, of my guys that I came up and trained with, I'm the last person to be getting my black belt, right? Like it's, t I mean, 16 years, bro. You can become a fucking doctor sooner than you can, get it, you know, like that's true. Like 16 years. Who? What have you done for 16 years to then get to? You know, and then they're by the like, by the way, you're now starting over. You yeah, know what I mean? yeah, like great. So it's, um, you know, you have to like get get past that and just focus on you know your technique. And we see definitely see different levels. But to me, it really makes me appreciate where I am because our, you know, we have people that are training for ADCC that come by. Muhammad Ali was over training with us, you know, recently. Tom DeBlas, you know, when he trains for his, uh, his fights, you know, Sean, uh, my professor, um, Sean Steuben is his jujitsu, his preferred jujitsu training partner. Like when I first came there, I remember coming there with 
a lot of jujitsu experience and rolling with him. And he's like my size. Like we're pretty much the same. I think he's like a little bit taller, but we're, we're basically like the same size. There should be no huge size advantage. And I literally could do zero things to this guy. Like I was, I was, I did. I mean, it was again, another one of those, I would like a white belt flashback where I was like, what is happening right now in this situation? Because I can't pass your guard. I can't, I can't even get near you. And, and you keep tapping me out. Like, what the hell are you doing? And to me, I was, but that then there, it triggered this like thought. I was like, wow, there's this guy who is just phenomenal at jujitsu. Like, what an example. Like, what, what, what an amazing, I can't even believe that that's like, that's like a whole nother level now that I can strive for. So now I'm like learning under him. So now anytime that I'm doing well against him, that's like my litmus test, yeah. right? Where that's where, I, <laughs> that's where I gauge like how well I'm doing is like how well I'm doing against him. I mean, we have some monsters at the gym that are just, super talented and and i think when you have that coupled with a gym full of like really cool people that all just like want to learn jujitsu like it's an incredible gym to to be a part of you know um and there's a lot of people that probably get stuck at places because of their options um but i think the advice you know would be to for longevity is to really find a place where you feel supported and 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 feel like it's a place where you can grow and you know what i mean because there's a lot of the McDojo ass places out there. <laughs> you know. Yeah, absolutely. So going into your your brand, Epic Roll, at what point did you think, man, I kind of want to start like I love jujitsu so much, I kind of want to incorporate it more into my life through like a brand or something like that. And at that point, did you have underscore BJJ in your Instagram tag? <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I uh <laughs> I was actually Epic Roll was just going to be a URL. I came up with the name um and then I was going to I bought the URL and I was going to do like jujitsu videos with my my buddy Philip who's a he's a black belt with us and and um we were going to make videos like just beginner intermediate advanced videos and this was kind of before a lot of the platforms and everything was popping up, like now I'm glad that I didn't spend time doing that. Cause it'll be like, who is this guy that's doing videos? Yeah, right. Or you could buy, or you could buy famous people's <laughs> grappling videos. Right. You know what I mean? Like, or you could buy mine. So it was just, it was a silly idea, but it, it, uh, at that same time I had kind of found out about drop shipping. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with mm -hmm. drop shipping. That's what I was going to ask you about okay. that too, because I'd what never if, heard of it until I was researching you. Okay. Yeah. And then I was like, man, this is, I need, I need to know more about this. We want to do stuff with our podcast similarly, right? Like elbows tight and send yep. out merch and whatnot too. So, but if you go into detail, by all means, Absolutely. please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I had I found out about this, and ba basically, drop shipping allows people to not hold inventory and still sell product. So you can, and you can do that through a combination of reselling other just products or white labeling products with like your own brand, right? So, as an example, when I when I applied that to Epic Roll, I had you know a T-shirt design. Well, I can go on and have a Shopify site, and I can make a T-shirt design, and I could make 50 t-shirt designs and have them all on here with however many color options Aww. and size options and everything there. And what happens is when somebody goes to order it, the company that you're using to do your drop shipping will take that exact size shirt and color and they will print the exact design on it and they package it and they ship it to the person, they charge them and they give you your profit and they take their enormous profit that takes away from your profit. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, you know, when you think about... A lot of uh, martial arts schools, a lot of places, inventory just gets stuck in the corner. Like you buy random sizes, you think you're going to hold it, you're not. And so this allowed me to create a bunch of different designs, you know, really get out like a lot of the inspiration designs that I've had without me having to order inventory on these. Now, that is limited to the type of products that these different companies um, offer, right? So... Um, I use as an example, Printful is one of my, um, manufacturers and distribution outlets, and they have a good, uh, user interface, um, the products and the shirts, you know, the type of shirts that I, that I want to, to use. Um, and they have fulfillment centers even over in Europe. So like I'll get orders in Germany and over in Europe in different areas, um, that they fulfill to. Um, and while you don't make as much on the profit of each sale of that to me right now, especially because Epic roll is not 
something that I have to have the income from, you know, to survive, I'm just growing the brand, right? It's, it's about the brand recognition. It's about, you know, getting it out there and just building that, um, more than anything. So, uh, the tricky part came in when I started to evolve the t-shirts and hoodies and things that are drop shipped into other items that are not available for drop shipping, like fight shorts and rash guards and geese and jujitsu belts and things like that. Um, those items are still very hard to source, you know, in the U S they're still very hard. I mean, it's just, it's such a pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> very, you no, know, I know. I mean, yeah. and like companies like origin, like I, I respect the hell out of them. Like, I think it's awesome. They were able to buy a loom and like make their own shit and do all that's great. It's just not in the cards for a lot of people, especially starting out. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but I think the drop shipping thing is great because again, it allows you to really put products out there without, you know, like if I did a design and it sucked and people hated it and never bought it, it didn't cost me anything yeah. to do that unless it was a rash card. You know, you get to a point, like I, I've gotten to a point where I can put things out on Instagram and get feedback and I get enough feedback from people that I could say, Hey, we're going to do these two rash cards next. Which, which one do you guys want? You know, and, and vote and, you know, it's easy to get feedback now to kind of help navigate, um, you know, kind of what people want, but that's, that's essentially how it works, um, with the drop shipping. And so it kind of happened organically. I just, I had all of the other jujitsu sh shirts, like the choke Republic shirts and things like that. And I think I felt that there was sort of a void in lifestyle jujitsu shirts it seemed to be kind of two spectrums. You had like super corny and then you had some like, okay, kind of stuff like choke Republic would put out some cool stuff, but like I was not, I was over the Starbucks coffee jujitsu logo and the Coca-Cola jujitsu logo. Yeah. And the, you know, like I just, you know, I just, I felt like there needed to be something a little bit, honestly, like cooler that needed to be out there and just, you know, stuff that you could wear every day and stuff that, uh, you know, um, was still comfortable. It just wasn't so in your face necessarily in, in all of the designs. So to make more of, again, like a lifestyle brand. So that was really the drive is I just, I had a couple ideas and, and through those ideas, I think the brand was well received by people. It sort of is a very middle of the ground, right? It's not too in your face and too aggressive, it, you know, men, women, children, kind of everybody dig it. So, um, uh, so that through people kind of saying, Hey, do you make rash guards? I'm like, well, I guess I should. <laughs> right. I'm like, well, we should make that too. And, um, and now I've got a basement filled with product and I spend every day going to the post office and, Ooh. uh, it's crazy. I, I get it with it, but it's great, man. Too aggressive. I get that. you know, I, I try to tell my wife that all the time. She'll buy me a lot of clothes. She normally dresses me. And uh, some of them always end up just stored somewhere. And she's like, why don't you wear this? And I'm like, look, I'm not, I don't want to wear it. It's got somebody's logo that takes up the whole front of the shirt. They're not paying me to advertise their brand. I'm like, why do I want to wear that? Like, just too much for me. Totally get it. Yeah. And one thing, too, yeah. that I've noticed about, like, jujitsu uh, style gear and whatnot is it's like jujitsu, like, in your face. Like, I do jujitsu. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like. Uh, I mean, I like, I, I wear a shirt that has a, a blue belt on the back. You know what I mean? Like most of the time my sweater, my, it, for the podcast, people are like, Oh, what's elbows tight podcast. And you know, I tell them and whatnot, but it's not like on the back, it says, I do jujitsu. Ask me about jujitsu. Yeah, you know like, what I mean? It's like carrying a concealed right. weapon, you know, like I'm not going to open yeah. carry. I don't want everyone knowing like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's just the way it is. Yeah. Is that something you know? You said yeah. that you noticed in the market too. Was it kind of like just the the blatant like I get okay, bro, we get it. You you, you do CrossFit kind of thing, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, man, and and it's okay. Like you know, I have some. I mean, this is kind of you know, it's kind of an aggressive, kind of an aggressive shirt. But it's but but that's not you know every shirt. I really wanted to create a brand that sort of could bring you know men, women, children, kind of everybody together, something everybody could get behind, something that was witty and had good design and good. I mean, my background was in design and, and marketing and just, you know, like kind of a, uh, a side of the brain, you know, person a, right. Isn't that the creative I'm one? Gonna, I'm going to go with that because no, I'm just stupid. Be. So, <laughs> so you, you don't regret the drop left shipping. or right. Maybe it's left or right. Maybe we're thinking left or right. No, I think right side yeah, of the you're right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. A and B, but I think it's right side. Can someone Instagram DM me when you hear this, like, let us know. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure I'm a right side of the brain person. You can fact check me. No, you're right. You're right. It's right side. That's the creative one. That's the creative. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So left's engineer, um, right? Like engineering. Man, I'm, right. I'm gonna go ahead and take a drink of my beer. I have no idea what's going on. Right now. <laughs> so on yeah. the drop shipping, yeah. I had a question for that. Uh, yeah. do, does that mess with you as far as like um when people return items or like customer service problems if you go through something like that? So they're pretty good about like I've had a mug one time that was broken when it so somebody sent me a thing and I sent them the photo and said this was broken they shipped another one oh that nice was um they're they're pretty good like if something is messed up they'll take a photo and do it if like my policy personally is that it, I would never I'm amazed at some companies <laughs> like my buddy Rob who runs McDojo Life I was at his house a couple months ago and he was on the phone with this company Nest or one of the like the you know the thermometer like home That's thermometer it. Nest or one of those companies. I don't want to say the wrong company and give him shit if it was not Nest. Well, Nest is Google, so I don't. <laughs> yeah. So whatever it was, it was one of these companies. I mean, I heard like the 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 crazy month long journey that they took him on to give him like a replacement was fucking nuts. And I was like, dude, you don't know this guy. He's relentless. Like this is what he does for a living. He goes after people like you can't like, you know what I mean? Just give him how much does it cost you as a huge company to just get this guy off your ass for a second. And by the way, like he's an influencer, like, you know, you, you could get some accolades or you could get some, some, some bad notes. So, I mean, how it, it, it blows my mind when people don't just like rationally look at this. If somebody sends me something and they're like, Hey, three months ago, I brought, I bought your shorts and they're ripped here. I'm like, here's a new pair. Right. Like done. I don't care, man. Like I don't, I'm, I, I, I I'm so humbled by the fact that like people send me messages and stuff. They're like, you're my favorite jujitsu gear. This is like all I wear and all this stuff. That's like mind blowing to me. So to me, I don't like, I know how it works, man. If, if somebody has a bad experience, I won't just like refund their product. I'll like refund it and also send them. Some <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Like, that's you know what good. I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You, yeah. I, you, you go above and beyond because bro, this is a, the, the jujitsu industry is a, in, in a community is a very tight knit place. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so for me, it's like, I want to show people, I want my customer service of those kind of things to be an example of like the jujitsu community and how we take care of our people and how like we care about people over profits. You know what I mean? Like that's what's more important. And by the way, when you do that with those type of people, when they have maybe not even a bad experience, but they have a problem and you fix it, those people become like your biggest fans. Yep. Those people become the ones that go above and beyond to like talk about how you resurrected their whole problem and fixed it and, and solved everything. Like it's basic stuff. You know what I mean? It's basic stuff. So, so that's like kind of always how, how I, how I deal with that. I mean, it's, and, and if I don't have something in stock, like I'll just make it right. Like whatever I need to do, there's no situation. Like how pissed is somebody going to be if like they order something, it's messed up and you go, well, here's all your money back plus another free thing. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're still okay. a dick. This was messed up. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not allowed to have accidents because you know, like, I mean, some people, you can't please everybody all the time. I get it. But like in my instance, I never have issues with that, man. People are, are super cool and, and get it. And if you take that approach, you don't have to stress. You know what I mean? You don't have to worry. Like, I don't want people out there hating on be like, this guy's like a cheap <laughs> right, skate. Right. You know what I mean? Like, not worth it. So when you first started, I, I pay attention to a lot of entrepreneurship because we're trying to, like I mentioned earlier, we're trying to turn this in more into than just a podcast in the long run. And one thing a lot of business uh people talk about especially when it comes to like clothing or some type of merchandise is you have to give a lot of it away for free when you first start to get your name out there because no one's gonna buy something they don't know what it is right did you have to do that when you first started did you give away well not necessarily give away but you like friends family or people that you trained with did you give them free products say hey man tell me what you think about this you know tell your friends if you like it was that something that first you had to first do 100 percent. yeah Hundred percent. Um, I still like. I will still when I reach out to people because I'm trying to take a. This has worked out so well for me, and so my network of of people and who I work with, like everything about that, the way that I've kind of the philosophy I've had with that has seemed to work out really well. So I've I've kept it up, and when I contact people 
on Instagram, you know, obviously I, I'm only looking for people who have big followings, who have a lot of engagement, who are like posting, you know what I mean? Because I'm just not in the business of just giving people like, yeah, that's not sustainable. Away. It's there, right. There's, you know, some strategy here, obviously, but, um, but when I reach out to people, I just tell them, Hey, this is who I am. I see that you do jujitsu, you know, that's cool, whatever. I just want to know if I can send you some of my stuff to check out, like no strings attached. You don't have to post anything. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. If you feel compelled and you like it, by all means, you know, post something about it, but there's no stress. There's no stress. Like I don't ever, I've had people contact me and they're like, Hey, we'd love to work with you and review this. And we'll give you an awesome discount on purchasing our products so that you can review it. And I was like, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, absolutely not. It's not how this works. Yeah. You can send me stuff and then I will review yeah. it or I will, you know, whatever, but that's, I'm not paying you for like, and so, uh, I, I then I kind of fall back on the confidence that I have in my designs. And like, I, I feel at this point, I've been very fortunate enough to have a, a really great, uh, um, perspective on the designs and the clothing from some like really, I would say important people in this business that I would assume that if my stuff was garbage, I would have known, right. like they would have told me it would have been like, things wouldn't be progressing the way that they are. Um, sales wouldn't be progressing the way that it is if, if it were going the other way. So I, I feel, um, confident that in my design abilities and it's just kind of getting it out there. So I, I kind of in the back of my mind know, Hey, if I send this to them and, and it works out, you know, great. Like that's, that's the cool part. I get lots of free stuff sent to me now. It's weird how that works. Right. But it's fun. Like it's, it's like you, you and, and we all work to try to help each other. Like a lot of these companies and my sponsors and stuff, they're, they're companies that we're all, you know, small business owners that are working together to help boost each other up and, and, brand recognition and, you know, send people their way and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's fun, um, uh, for sure to kind of, to kind of do that. So, um, so I just take a very organic approach to things with, you know, with that and sending people this stuff and, and then you build content from that. Right. And then that helps. Cause the reality is, is that you re it takes a long time for people to care, you yes. know, like it really does. You're posting a long time before people are engaging and looking at you. You're, you're doing posts, you're doing all this stuff and, and nobody gives a shit for a while, but <laughs> you know, but eventually like that. if you're persistent, I mean, it is, it's true. It's true. It's true right. Like I'll put a lot of, but, I'll put a lot of effort into a single Instagram post. I'm like thinking through like writing this great description. And then I tell my wife, I'm like, I like legitimately thought about like every piece of this content and I mean, likes don't determine if someone if it's good or not. But I'm like, I don't have like I had like zero engagement on it. It's like it's kind of discouraging, but you got to know, no one gives a shit who I am right now, right? Like, I mean, we have a good following of this podcast, but it's like you have to. It, it's it doesn't happen overnight. You got to freaking grind and then keep being consistent with it. It's a, it's. A, I mean, bro, managing like you know, I'm because I manage the like, well, five Instagram pages, but three, like, like regularly, you know, my real estate one epic role and, um, my fitness bottle, um, the one bottle project that we're getting ready to launch. And it's so much work, man. Like just that alone, you know, with, especially when you're trying to not put out garbage, right. like, especially when you're trying to take time and like put out, put, you know what I mean? It's dude, it's such a, uh, such a hustle, such a grind to, to, to do that. And you have to be consistent. And it's like, for most people, it seems so stupid too. They're like, you look like you're some idiot just sitting on social media trying to post and like, you know, whatever. But in my case, I do a ton of business off of Instagram, uh, like a huge, you know, portion of my interaction with my network and people and influencers, everybody are like through that. So for me, it's a very useful tool and, um, warrants my time, you know, to, to, to build it. And when I look at the correlation between sales and growth of the page and where it was last year to this year, I mean, there's like, it would be silly for me to not, you know, continue doing the same kind of stuff. Like if, you know, if I'm getting a good result, then it's just, yeah kind of, you know, being consistent. Yeah. And one thing I've noticed too, with Instagram is it's, it's kind of like the no one wants to post something that someone else isn't already posting about kind of mindset. You know what I mean? Like once you get that first in from my eyes, once you start getting those people to start posting pictures of your stuff or posting stories about your stuff, then other people that use it or wear it, they're like, oh, 
okay, people are already starting to talk about this. Like now I can join in on it. Like they could have been a friend, uh, like a fan for a long time, but they just never made that leap to like talk about it on social media. And then once people start doing it, right, that then it's just kind of like you go like, oh man, I got tagged in sixteen posts today or three posts today or whatever. It's like now I can start using that, like you said, as content to to further my business because obviously you're getting good feedback, right? Yeah, and that's what I was trying to do. Is I really like that's why I post anybody who you know who 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 buys some epic role they take a photo like i put them on there like i don't there's some pages that are you know they have very specific filters they have very specific models it's very specific things but this was always meant to be like more of a community mm -hmm. and and more building a community through it and not being like oh you're not you don't have a big following you're not going to end up on this page or you know what i mean like taking that kind of an approach like it's just i i i am just you know, we, I've sold stuff in like nine countries in almost all 50 States. And so to me, that's like the coolest thing. Yeah. Like, I don't, you know, I just seeing people like around the world and seeing these messages and I'll pop on Instagram and just some random school in Washington state. And there's somebody wearing Epic Roll stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, damn, it's like, it's like a trip, dude. It really is. It's such a trip. Like I'm, yeah, I'm so humbled. Like I say it not being braggadocious. I say it like truly humbled by the fact that like that, that people, you know, care that much and they spend a, like a lot of money. You know yeah. what I'm saying? They spend, a, they spend a lot of money, um, on this stuff. So it's, it's pretty incredible. So, so for me, it's like, I gotta, you know, I, I keep kind of pushing forward for, for that too, you know, for those people in the community that we're kind of growing. So when you look, you mentioned earlier, like you have, now you sponsor people, you do collaborations. What do you look for when you're either sponsoring a, like this could go for people that are, you know, wanting to get sponsored by other companies and whatnot. What do you look for when you're looking for an athlete or an influencer? And what do you look for in a company, right? You're not just going to grab any random gi company that hits you. Like we were talking about before we started recording, right? Like a <laughs> random person in Pakistan saying, hey, I have good gis. Let's do a collaboration. Yeah. What do you look for when, you, when you're doing these things? Um, so first with the athletes, it's, it's about how often they're competing, what their current sponsorships are with other companies, and what they're looking for from me. So... Like as an example with Mason Fowler, super well-known grappler, doing really good, has a bunch of sponsors, but he didn't have a Nogi sponsor. And so I was able to go in and go, cool, let's make a Mason Fowler brand. Like let's like you have a name for yourself. Let's start creating, you know, some gear for you so that you can start making, you know, that a revenue source. There's value to these people and their brands. So, um, so we were able to do that. And then a lot of the times it might just be including some of those other sponsors in the stuff or they can put my logo on their gi, but, or I could design their Nogi stuff. So everybody's really individual and different, but in, but right now it's really, you know, working with people. And I, and I, again, it's not that I don't have complete belief and faith that there are these, you know, amazing grapplers coming up that, you know, maybe they got 400 people on the screen. It doesn't, that's not a necessarily a direct marker to that how successful they are going to be but <clears throat> as a business owner and having a certain limited budget for marketing and certain things like that i have to be conscious and aware of where marketing dollars are going and where product is going so um, a lot of time it's about people that have a decent following you know on Instagram, like that are going to have at least 20,000 people or more, you know, and, um, and that are posting and competing, you know, normally like where there's going to be visibility, right? right? Like we've had, I've had two world champions compete, you know, and, and win in, in Epic Roll Gear. And, uh, so that, that's kind of what, what, with that. And then with the companies I do I, right now, I'm still in a position where I can kind of do some of these one-off projects. Um, I, I work with a, a Chicago police department and I design all their rash guards for the, for them. They all train jujitsu. It's That's like part cool. of their, um, thing with their, yeah, their new recruits. And so every couple months they, you know, I'll go on and turn the thing on on my website for that people to go on and order. And we, you know, I order them and send it to them. And so we'll do kind of fun projects like that. But, um, but with other companies, there's just been stuff that's recently popped up and it's very uh, unique and specific to the situation. So, which I can kind of talk about this cause it's not out there yet, but we've made, we've, like you hear it first guys, it you hear it first. Well. We're getting the exclusive. Yeah. Matt, <laughs> yeah. Matt yeah. yeah. It's not, it's, you're not hearing this anywhere else. Like I only say it because they posted it too. And <laughs> oh, so I was like, if you're posting it too, <laughs> See, somebody already said it. it's okay. 
I didn't say it. I did say it, but then they said it. So we both <laughs> said All right, it. Perfect. So it's happening. Um, but no, um, uh, Kill Cliff, uh, yeah. energy drinks. So they are the ones that, you know, they, they're jujitsu guys. These, the, the, the guys that run the company, um, and they don't make jujitsu gear. And so when they saw the gi that I did with Rob for the McDojo life, um, uh, documentary and kind of, we, we launched that gi when they saw that they were like, Hey, Asked Matt if he would design us like a, you know, a gi. And initially, um, I designed one for, uh, well, I don't want to say, okay, I'm not going to say that part, but I did, Thank I you. did, I did one, I did one for them. I'll tell you guys after okay. I did one. Um, and it's, and it's going to be like their introduction. It's going to be one that like they keep in stock, like their gi and their rash garden. Um, and then the goal would be to launch more stuff. And they have obviously, uh, a ton of, really cool athletes that they work with. And so the goal would be to develop these geese and rash guards and um, gear for these specific athletes to be able to launch so that they can create a revenue source for them because they, they sell, um, you know, certain clothing now, but not jujitsu stuff. Right. So, so that was an opportunity where I was like, I'm going to come up with a bang of design and send it to them. And they loved it. And so that was that. And now I'm like, holy shit, working with kill cliff. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I saw the actually saw the design on Instagram, and I was like, "Man, that is actually a fresh looking gi." I was like, "I didn't know that you actually designed it." I thought kind of like it was just kind of like yeah. you just collaboration thing of like obviously well it is, but like that that's yeah. that was awesome. I love the inside of it. How's the gray with the white kill cliff like printed all over it? I was right. like, "Dang man, I don't need a new gi. I don't need a new gi. You don't need a new gi. You absolutely don't, yeah. dude. My closet is ridiculous. I went through the majority of my jujitsu career with like two geese right you know what i mean like two geese dude and like probably like a hayabusa rash guard and just that was <laughs> it and now i have like two closets you know where i it's like just you know just filled with rash guards and geese and everything i'm like man i'm making up for lost time now so, so what was your go-to what was your go-to up. gi when you first started starting legend um it was a black fuji gi. man the ultralight or was it the like it the like it was the ultra fucking heavy yeah, but, is what it felt like. It was made out of carpet. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> is it yes, the like dude. the judo one? It was like one? a judo yes, gi. I was about to say yes, we have dude. those when we first started and it felt like I was wearing a rug. Like it was like I was walking I around like the kid from the Christmas story like holy shit. Oh. <laughs> man, like grabbing a piece of concrete, dude, like just bye bye yeah, knuckles. So that was like my ninja gi. <laughs> and then and then I think I had like a oh, what was the blue i think i had like a tatami or something mm -hmm. after that and um yeah so no it was pretty pretty terrible but i mean back then like it was i mean damn dude my first mma no it was like me my second mma fight i think i wore like tap out shorts yeah man like what a nerd you know what i mean <laughs> man watching people but walk actually, down the street with tap out was like the i was like yeah you oh probably just God. don't even train or i, I wasn't gonna wear you're like you're definitely not a fighter yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sequins jeans and like a you know yeah, let, like Ed Hardy shirt. Yeah, like, You're like okay, you know. Oh, uh, I go. You got true religion on. I can't trust you. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Well, here's a revenue exactly. source that I've seen that's missing, and oh. I see it all the time in the gym, and I'm experiencing it now. How come we don't have like some shoulder slings that are jujitsu orientated? When I was in the hospital and I had to put on that stupid robe with the weird buttons, I was like, man, I wish somebody would start making some jujitsu gear. How many people we see in there wearing arm braces? Yeah. ankle braces you Knees. name it uh they got wrist braces on and they're buying all this cheesy copper tone stuff and i'm like oh, we need somebody to make some cool stuff for that i know matt i know, you know, I know right <laughs> guy's the limit dude i you know i'm hoping to branch off eventually and kind of take this in like a sort of like a quicksilver hurley sort of direction mm. as well um where i can kind of i think that name i had a couple of friends um kind of talk to me about that like you know a name kind of i think would work in a in a few different uh industries and i'm i'm you know i'm like hurley, hurley hat and freaking i'm a california boy you know mm -hmm. what i mean so um so i might i might branch off and and see about including some surfing skateboarding kind of uh you know designs eventually That'd be cool see what happens so jump yeah. kind of jump back into your your jujitsu journey uh when you were promoted to blue purple brown everything like that was it did you Come to find out, not many people test. Did you test for any of your belts, or was it kind of like, "Hey, congratulations"? No, it's just we just got our belts. Um, 
we did not do that. Uh, I <laughs> was already a brown belt at the school that did start doing that. Um, but before that, it was not. It was like you just kind of did it, and it was instructor discretion. And you know, I remember people like telling my instructor before I got my blue belt, they were like, "Hey, man, you should." probably promote this guy like you, you know like what do you what do you do like what else does he have to do and you know it's like one of those things and so he was like oh okay and i think it, early on it gave me a little anxiety i was like do these guys pay attention to, like what yeah. you're doing like do i need to like report in and let them know it's it's interesting how many different methodologies people apply to this like some people you you just they track your days in you know what i mean like yeah we the had efficiency that. or how well you perform doesn't matter you just like oh you were here these many days here's your belt i i think it it really to have it run the way that I would prefer would be just to have a really um, focused and observant instructor. You know what I mean? Because ultimately, they're, if you're getting a black belt potentially under them, then their approval should stand for something, right? Should should mean something. Um, and it, I think jujitsu is just hard because it takes so damn long to, you know, to, to progress. And you're at these belts for... Yeah, I mean, like I said, I've been a brown belt for six years. You know what I mean? Like, that's crazy. Like, who's, I mean, the, these belts that people have for these long times, I mean, it's really hard. So I think if it can be a little daunting, I think sometimes having the, I never had stripes either. We never did mm. any stripes. My brown belt was the first time that I ever got any stripes. Never did it. But I can see the value in doing it for people when you're trying to commercialize the sport a little bit. Like, I know that people don't necessarily want to commercialize it, but you have to, you know, if you're starting it as a business, like you want to make money it's a shitty business. If you're in a business, it doesn't make any money. Um, and so I think to prepare people and maybe give them a little bit of a marker of like where they are, a little marker of acknowledgement of here, you know, yes, it's not about the belt for God's sakes, we get it. But also, <laughs> you know, it's, it's about growing your business. And like, it, 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 you know, if you have somebody that's a, five or six year blue belt and they have zero stripes and they might just go like, what's happening? You know, like, so, I mean, everybody's obviously free to kind of take that approach how, how they want, but, but we didn't, um, we, we don't do that at our school either. We, people were just given belts because we are constantly rolling and constantly training hard and kick, you know what I mean? It's like, they don't necessarily have to go through a gauntlet, um, at the end to, to get the belt, you know? So. so you mentioned your your instructor being observant and you know kind of paying attention to you. In your eyes, what makes a good instructor? Is it their belt? Do they compete? Like what what aspects of jujitsu do you look for or leadership when you look for a, a good black belt to train under? I would say that at my school, it always it always sounds like I'm just being biased because I'm here, but I I will, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like everybody's their fanboy of their school. I totally understand that. Like I I do I get it, but I but I I try to say this very sincerely because I have context of, you know, three different associations and 16 years of jujitsu, and I will say that that our instructor now. Um, exemplifies everything that I would say would be what would make you a great instructor. Number one, he has cultivated a, a culture within the gym that is welcoming and inviting and fun and exciting and just awesome. Right. So like, that's, that's one thing is like, you know, it's a top down approach. I believe it's just like companies, right? There's a difference of, of a uh, customer service from Chick-fil-A versus like McDonald's. It's a, it's a company culture type of a thing, right? So, so in this company culture, um, he's, he's created and nurtured this environment that's, that's, you know, very friendly and very inviting, which obviously really motivates people to come and want to do jujitsu. Um, secondarily from that, uh, even though somebody might come into jujitsu, not really having any um, preconceived notions of how the training should necessarily go, but we follow these modalities that would be, you know, us working on the back position for like two months, you know, we're working front headlock position for three months. Like we're working these certain positions where we're integrally understanding them so completely from every direction, every position. So when we leave those, we're, we we leave with with a bit of a refinement in that in that aspect of our game, which typically in in when I started, it was you come in and the instructor's like 
guess what? Today we're doing ankle locks and then like, and then we're going to do triangles. And then tomorrow we're going to do breaking from the guard and like knee cut pass. And you're like, how the fuck are these connected? <laughs> oh, yeah. And I wasn't even thinking that, but yeah. you're like, how is this connected? It's just not right. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense. It's not an efficient way to learn jujitsu. And you start forgetting stuff um, to tell you the truth. You really start forgetting like, time, like fuck, what did we do last week? Yeah, like, what was Thursday? Yeah. I don't even remember. Yeah. All the time, all the time. It just doesn't make sense. And so I wasn't fortunate enough to to have that type of a uh, situation until going to Silverback. But um, but my jujitsu has gotten exponentially better being in this system, plugging myself into um, his system of an, an approach to jujitsu. Um, and so I think I think that. And then also somebody, you know, I'm I I understand that black belts. You know, by the time they're black belts, a lot of people are broken and old and it's hard and I get it. <clears throat> but I really respect the black belts that continue to push themselves, that continue to learn and evolve and that do put themselves out there and do train their students and do roll with their students because you know, like my instructor wants us to beat him. You know what I mean? He's never going to let it happen, but he <laughs> wants us to beat him. Like he wants us to get to that point. Like that's his goal. And you can see that, um, you can feel that in, in his approach, um, and how he breaks things down. He's also very analytical. I mean, he'll break out a whiteboard and start writing shit down Mm. where I'm like, I'm like, it's, it, it blows my mind. I said to him the other day, I was like, I don't even know how you retain the stuff that you retain and, and can regurgitate it just like on demand. Like it's super impressive. It's super impressive. He, he, he knows so much about every situation. You could tell that he's just such a true martial artist and such a, such a man that's dedicated to his craft and really spends time with it. It's, you can't fake it, right? Like he, he has some, some credentials that are mind blowing. And one of them being that no black belt has ever walked into our gym and ever submitted him. So just wrap your mind around that. And Muhammad Ali has come into our gym and ADCC. I mean, like you're just saying, it's like, again, he's like my size. This isn't some gorilla man that I'm talking about. (laughs) Like we're talking about a normal ass dude who you're just, who just somehow has superpowers. Um, but, uh, so I think I think all those things go together, and somebody who is really willing to assess each individual student's journey and able to help them. Because I've had friends where the schools didn't give a shit about them; they cared about their profits. And so when they're going to their instructors, going like, "I'm struggling," or like, "I'm struggling to find the motivation. I'm stuck. I'm feeling stuck. I'm feeling like I'm not learning." You know, we all we all hit these little. Um, like roadblocks and, 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 uh, points, little lulls throughout our journey. And almost every single belt happened to me, every single belt. Um, and so not having a support system around that and not, you know, especially when you're a, a senior belt and you've gone through these things to not, you know, take that person and try to work with them. Cause in my mind, the goal is to have them keep doing jujitsu, right? Like that's the goal, spread the love, spread jujitsu, more people get them involved. <clears throat> so, so, I, you know, having somebody who can take somebody's individual journey and still, you know, make them feel like they care about that and they're acknowledging that and really work with them. And, you know, then, then that to me is, is all the ingredients of like a, of a solid instructor, you know, man, that was great. Yeah, no, that was, that was a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic answer. So you mentioned you've been a, a brown belt for six years. Like, uh, or, yeah, you've been 16. doing shit since yeah. 16. You've been a brown belt for six years. Um, has that ever kind of demotivated you because you're like, man, like six years is a long time at a belt. And like, if it, at those points, if you have hit them, what have you done to kind of break through that barrier to, to keep training? So it did. I always was giving the advice about hitting those lulls, like to other people. So I always felt like I had to take my own advice. So when I got stuck in a situation or at a belt, I usually would just find something that was interesting to me within jujitsu. Um, for example, like triangles. And I was like, instead of, you know, dwelling on this fact that I'm, you know, feeling stuck or I'm not learning new stuff. I was like, I'll take triangles and I'll just start doing some stuff on my own of like every entry to a triangle, something to distract myself where I can focus on this. And hopefully the byproduct is that I, I kind of move past my little lull and, and, you know, keep going on. But, and in the, and in the meantime, I've also kind of, you know, 
help myself uh, occupied and, and maybe develop some other little secondary skills, right? Like now maybe my, my triangles are a little bit better um, than they were before. So that has been something. And, and yes, I, I, <laughs> I was sandbagged with my, with my black belt for, for, you know, for a while and, and a lot of things happened. Um, but I will say this, I am, I'm very grateful now in hindsight because, uh, getting my black belt where I am, um, and with the people, you know, and the, the association I'm under means way more to me now. My, my jujitsu, I didn't, I got to go to a place and recognize that like, while I could have been a black belt, I wasn't a good enough black belt that I wanted to be. Like yeah. I saw these other people in my school, these brown belts and these belts, and I was like, no, 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 this is like, I'm the, I need to be at that level, like, right. Like I need, I need to spend the time to get at that level. And the nice part is, is that I had such a good time because I've always been teaching. I've always been teaching everybody. And so I got to go to this, this school and be a student again, uh. right? Like take time and be able to be a student and really just like learn. And so my jujitsu got so much better. So the confidence that I have, you know, now is, was well worth the wait. You know, so when we do our promotions next month, like I don't, I'm like, great. That's, you know, it's a, it's a lot of pressure, right? Like, cause everywhere you go, like you're a black belt now, yeah. like that's a big deal. That's a, like every school now you're a black belt. That's a huge thing. So, um, so I, I'm very grateful for being able to take a step back and especially in that time, see black belts coming in that just got their asses handed to them by lower belts. And I just was like, that's I never want that yeah. to be me, and that's not a disrespect to lower belts. That's just a hey man, there's something that's supposed to come along with saying you're a jujitsu black belt, and that means something to me. And so you know, I was willing to like getting Sean's acknowledgement that I'm a black belt is all that I needed. You know what I mean? When you have such a high level of respect for for your instructor and for their level of competency within this art. Like that's what, what made me just go, cool, man. I'm, I'm good to sit here. Cause let me tell you something, as much as people want belts, it's always better to be the four stripe brown belt that's tapping black belts than the black belt that's getting tapped by lower belts. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's always better to be that, that other guy. Um, you know, what, what is that? I mean, when you're a brown belt and you're tapping by, it's like, that's, 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 that's a, that's a good sign. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was a little bit of a frustration of, you know, sitting back and feeling like, damn, I, I kind of got gypped and I, this should have happened a while ago, but I also went, you know what? Like I, I'm a firm believer that like things in life happen for a reason and, you know, and the universe corrects itself and things happen in the time that they're supposed to. And to be quite honest, the, the people that are coming and the, that are going to be there for this event and all this kind of stuff is, wouldn't have happened at this other time. So it was like, it worked out perfectly and it's a beautiful thing. And so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very content at this point. Yeah. Kind of to your point too, about, the, uh, being the Brown belt, tapping black belts, it's sponsored athlete. You do Mason Fowler, right? He's the welterweight submission underground champ. Right. And he's beating experienced, like well-known world champ black belts. You know what I mean? Like, and to me, yeah. I was like, oh man, when I found out Mason wasn't, wasn't a black belt, I was like, man, that's even more impressive. <laughs> like, cause in my eyes, I was like, that's a black belt beating a black belt. And I was like, wait, he's a brown belt. And like the, the, the difference of, I, I don't know, like, what do you feel the difference between like a well-established brown belt and then that black belt is like, where do you think that threshold is broken? Dude. It's, uh, it's muddy waters. Bro. Right. I was thing, talking to right? Mason, like, I, I, yeah, I talked, we were talking about it. Him and I were both talking about it like a couple months ago. And by the way, Mason just got know, his black belt like, too, everyone. If you're listening at home, you don't know. I was just, well, I was just going to say, yes, he, he did just get it. And it's funny. Cause I texted him that day and I was like, Hey man, congratulations. I was like, you son of a bitch. You got it a month before me. <laughs> and he's like, he, and he goes, yeah. And he goes, so I'm always going to be your senior. I was like, yeah, but I'm like, I was like, but I'm 41 years old. So I'm your fucking elder. So I was like, so, you know. So I was like, you're my senior, but I'm your elder. Age before beauty. <laughs> yeah. Age before beauty. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean it's it it the same thing. Like he right, he's out there and he's 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 doing that and 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 beating bells. I think it's a it's definitely muddy waters, man. You at at that point, you know, brown to black, usually usually I would say is not the belt that you're lingering at the longest. I think people's circumstances 
can change that. Um, I think I read that like Joe Rogan was like a brown belt for like 12 years yeah. and Guy Ritchie was like a brown belt for like same thing, like a long time, Chris Cyborg. I think there was, I mean, there are people and obviously celebrities, certain people that have, you know, things going on in their life, they can't train as often, but, um, but in general, you're usually not supposed to be that belt, um, that long. And so I think it's, it's, it's very muddy waters. And, and I've just recognized now at this point that there are so many levels of black belts and I'm, and I'm just like, I, I don't, I don't know. I would never want to walk around insecure going anywhere in the country, any we're traveling to these schools and, and wearing a black belt. Like if that's how you feel, then that's a sign that you're not one. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that being at silverback and working under Sean and, and our different instructors gave me that confidence for sure, because it pushed me to a level where I, I'm competing against and going against people where I'm like, Oh, if I'm doing great with these people, then this is great. Cause we were one of the top schools in the area, no doubt. You know, you, you remember training with uh, Blaine? He was a, a brown belt we trained with in Japan. Yeah, that's still one of the like I, I'll never forget that guy. He was one of the hardest people I've ever rolled with, and I can't imagine anyone really beating him. <laughs> like, it was, was the first brown belt we've ever rolled with, and like till this day, that is a brown belt to me. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like he was instruction, unbelievable instruction wise. I was like, a phenomenal instructor, and like. It was just soul crushing rolling with him. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Unbelievable. Like, that's 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 to me when I think of, I always think of Blaine. Like yeah. that guy was unbelievable. Yeah, it was kind of like yeah. you, you mentioned. Um, if you feel like you know when you're at that black belt level, like oh man, I don't know if I should be a black belt. Then that's probably like could have cultivated a little bit longer. What do you? How do you feel when you leave a class where you're like you just you have one of those nights where you're like damn, man, I just got my ass kicked all night long. Like how, how, how do you feel during those situations then? Um, I would say I don't have those days very often. I think the closest thing that I have to that is, you know, my body not cooperating, like, like, you know, hitting the gym and like, I'm really sore and I just, my cardio is I'm sucking wind or whatever, you know what I mean? And I think those are just, you know, why you kind of have to have the whole mind, body, spirit thing. I think all that components are, all those components are important. So, um, for me, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I kind of, I mean, I, I'm at the top of the crop with our people, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, mostly I'm there to help people and help them grow. And you know what I mean? But we have some like animals there. So it's always, it's never like, you always feel great. Like you, whenever I'm in there and I'm just getting hammered and just, we're going, it's like, it's great because I just, I appreciate the level of talent that we have there. You know what I mean? It's like nothing to me. If I go in and get my ass kicked, that's like a great day, you know, because then it's pushing me, right? It's, it's pushing me. It's never, how, if you're, if you're at, the, if you're always at the top, if you're not getting challenged, it's very hard to grow. So we're, I'm lucky to have some like, you know, not only a ton of black balls, but a ton of brown balls, really solid purple balls, you know, um, around me to train with all the time. So it's, it's, it like we, you know, we embrace and love the suck, I guess. Yeah. That's one thing that there is a, there's a saying that I heard when I was in the Navy and it was, if you're the smartest person in the room, you should probably find another room, like in the aspect of like, you should always have personal growth. Like you should always be looking for someone that you can grow from. And I think jujitsu is such a prime example of that like like you talk about like you 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 go to silverback and you're like holy crap there's once again there's just a new level of you're constantly finding more and more like better people better teaching better technique and you can always hone your craft like even if you think you know everything you can always become yeah it's going to elevate you yeah you can become more efficient at a technique you can tighten it up a little bit there's all there's no one in in jujitsu is has been perfect at it there's always something oh yeah uh, just minor things right micro adjustments oh right? good <laughs> lord i haven't heard that in a while <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> i mean it, it it is though you have like when you there was so many moments where we're learning something and I'm like, damn, I've been doing this for 16 hours. I've never seen that applied like that. In fact, I'm like, we were even taught things that I would go as far as to say were absolutely incorrect. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like literally incorrect. And I would sit with Sean and, and, you know, I would go through a couple things and I'm like, Hey, this is what we were always shown. Like, and he's go, and, and he would literally go, well, let me show you exactly why that's incorrect. Yeah. And he would show me and I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, you're a ninja. Like you just, I, it's, it blows my mind. Like, so, 
it was it was incredible to see to have the, those like aha moments. I I still have them. I still go to class and still learn so much, and will continue to, because of the wealth of knowledge he has and and how important those little details. And I think in my game now, it's about refining, right? Like there's a huge base and foundation I have now. It's about uh, fine tuning and making it more efficient. I'm 41 years old. So when I got to go out there and roll for an hour, you know, with a bunch of young purple belts, it's like, I got to take a deep breath and be able to do it. So I got to be able to understand my, my energy and conserve things when I need to. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing is really important. So, um, training smart and, uh, not going, Hey, wire in the beginning. John, you can relate to that. John, you're, I think you I'm guys about, are about the I same think I'm about age. to be 44 actually. Yeah. Yeah. So what you know the struggle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what do you do, what do, Matt? What do you do? Kind of maybe John can learn from you in playing. Well, you should that. tell him the majority of the students in our class are like Travis, the stud here, thirty and under. Don't that tell are, that because if I roll Matt, I don't want all, him to do. They're all <laughs> highly athletic, <laughs> and uh, I try to tell them all the time. It's it's different when I roll with somebody that's uh in their twenties. That's a stud that has energy through the roof, and I got to roll with a bunch of them, and they all want to roll with me because I'm one of the few blue belts in our school so every you know all the white belts want to beat me they give me their best and he he doesn't get it yet but i'm like you will one day i don't know to your point you talk about you know you go to a new school you have a target on your back i think that's with any colored belt our our black belt instructor is my age i think we're one month apart and uh it's easier for him you know because he's got all this knowledge base i started at 39 so i just don't have that skill set to really offset that youth and that energy Sure. No, I get it. It, it. it. I mean, it takes time. And really, I, I try to encourage, I finally got my brother-in-law to, to start training after seven years. He was married to my sister for seven years before he finally <laughs> hopped on. He, he, he got his, his blue belt like earlier this year, finally just nerds out, trains all the time, fucking loves it, changes his life. It's a whole thing. And I, I remember telling him one day to like motivate him because I kept trying to get him in there. And Granted, his life, everything that was going on, like it just, it was, it would have been hard to make it work when it did. And it's it, great when it did work out. But I texted him one day and I was like, hey, man, I just need you to rem- remember something. And I was like, until you start training jujitsu, you have to wake up every day knowing that if I wanted to kill you, <laughs> I could 100% kill I you. love it. I love yeah, it. 100%. <laughs> and he was just like, are you serious? And I was like, no. Yes. I'm no. Serious. I was but like, yes. so you got. You're right so, too. <laughs> and so now he's in it and you know loves it and you know it's it's fantastic. And then you're like, um, you send that reminder text. I could still kill you if I wanted. <laughs> I could still. Oh yeah. He said to me that day. He's like, you know, we've all been progressing. He goes, I've progressed against you in no way. At all. <laughs> he's like, I haven't. He's like, I have done no progression with you whatsoever. I was like, well, bro, you've been on the mats for like, you know, two years. I've been on the mats for 16. There's got, if, if that wasn't the case, I'd be fucking concerned. I'd be like, what am I doing right. here? Yeah. The, the big know? joke in our school yeah, is I, doing something I wrist lock as many of them as I can. <clears throat> and they're like, you always wrist lock. And I'm like, I got to, you're like, you know, that's the only way I keep, keep the distance. <laughs> yep. Yep. I like, I did like a quick, lock. like snap on, like just to let the person know there last night that there was a wrist lock right there. And they're like, Ooh. Yeah. I was like, yeah, you better watch it, bro. I ain't gonna, I'm not going to put it on them because like, I feel like wrist locks are one of those things. Like, if, when, if someone spazzes during a wrist lock, it, it ends bad. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm like I just let them know it's there. And then they're like, they get it out. I'm like, all right, there you go, man. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, That's Matt, so one question we always like to ask people is, especially because you, you just recently went through it with your brother in law, what is the one piece of advice that you would give to a brand new white belt just starting jujitsu? <clears throat> Well, I think it would depend on what their motivation for starting was. Um, if it was fitness based or if it was self defense based, <clears throat> but in any case, my advice would be to first make sure that they do their research and find a good school that is supportive. There's again, there's a lot of like bow to the belt bullshit out there yeah. and you know, you can get sucked into that. And, and jujitsu is one of those things, like when you get in, you know, it's such a long haul. So you're not usually popping over to this school and that school and this school, you know? So I think going in and really observing the culture and getting a vibe, like if you could see yourself there, cause there's guys that, you know, that do, they start later in their life and they come in and just see a bunch of crazy ass, you know, 20 something year olds that are just trying to rip each other's heads off. Like that's probably not going to be the environment where they're going to thrive. And, you know, so I think just making sure, first of all, that, you find a, a an environment that you feel comfortable in, um, and then being able to just be very patient. 
you know, because it's it's really if you continue doing jujitsu past like a blue belt and you and you you know it becomes part of your life like to for me i can't imagine it not being in my life like i can't imagine not having jujitsu and um uh so to me it's such an important thing and so like my fitness is based around just wanting to be able to stay on the mats you know as long as possible so I try to tell, you know, people are starting out, be patient and and really also don't be a hero, train the right way. You know, I hate the whole tap early, tap often because it's just so overused, but it, but really, you know, like I went home so many times where I couldn't turn my neck and I, I just, you know, trying like hell or high water to like fight out of stuff when it's like, Hey, this isn't the ADCC trials. Like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? This is class (laughs) inside of a group X studio. What the fuck? Um, so so it's just so for me, you know, I think those those three components like patience, you know, train smart, you know, don't don't be a hero um, and find somewhere you're comfortable. And, and usually that that's a, a pretty solid enough, I think, you know, uh, foundation for anybody to really go. It's just going to come down to if they, you know, want to go through it. I mean, God, that the, the, the pain, the physical and emotional and everything that you stress that you go through in jujitsu is crazy, but it's also. I think one of the most beneficial mm-hmm. because in jujitsu, it like, it helps you learn how to deal with adversity in business and in life and everything just as a natural byproduct. Cause you, you're so uncomfortable, right? You, you, you don't realize you're fighting every week. That's not a normal thing that most people do. They come home and they sit and they watch TV and they do their thing. And we're That's like trying point. to kill each other. Yeah. And, you know, it's just not a, it's not a normal thing. And so, um, so I think, I think just recognizing that, and, and, uh, um, you know, being consistent because you're not going to get anywhere in this trying to, you know, quick, fast track yourself, you know? Um, so having people that are senior belts to kind of give those lectures, I try to tell people this stuff all the time as much as I can, because I, you know, my, again, my goal is to like help people continue to do jujitsu and get more people involved, right? Keep growing the community. Yeah, absolutely. That was a, that was a great answer. Uh, John, you got anything else? I don't think so. I think we're good. You kind of, you know, well, you know, I'm about to say there's got to be something there. We, <laughs> well, it's it's kind of a, a, a touchy question. Somebody asked me this question recently, and I didn't have an answer for it. But uh, Travis knows what I'm talking about. We had some recent in our community where someone was attacked in a parking garage. Oh, and uh, uh, this lady, uh, God bless her soul, she got attacked. Um, she tried everything she could to, to get this guy off of her. The guy dropped his knife. She tried stabbing him. Uh, she tried everything she could. I mean, biting, you name Terrible it. situation. This guy is uh, over six foot, you know, 200 pound meth addicted guy, right? And um, she couldn't get him off of her. Uh, uh, it just so happened like a witness showed up and that's how this all stopped, right? But they asked me, and I've only been doing jujitsu for a couple years. But the question was, well, what would you tell her to uh, defend herself from that guy? And I, in my head, I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I was like, don't be there. That's the best thing I could think of, right? Like, And it, it turned into this conversation. And I was like, I just don't see. I mean, this person fought. They tried to stab him. They did everything they could. Um, female versus male. I understand the whole self-defense thing. And that was part of the question. They were like, well, should I do a self-defense class? And I was like, you know, honestly, I don't think that's going to help you in this situation. This person fought as hard as they could. They're overpowered. In my opinion, the only thing that would have saved them from that situation at that time was if they were packing something and that could have equalized it. Otherwise, not to be in the area. And that was that was a an interesting question to me because they thought because I had been doing this for a couple of years I'd have a answer to how to defend from that and I just didn't. Yeah, <clears throat> well, I have a few thoughts on that for sure. Um, I think that for a woman in that scenario, even if you're going to consistently train, which Let's just say for like most of the soccer moms or whatever, they're not going to be in there putting in the, you know, learning their Muay Thai strikes and their jiu-jitsu takedowns, all the stuff on the hopes that they have to deploy it one day when they get attacked. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm a huge Second Amendment fan and I've concealed carried for as long as I legally could. Um, I, you know, you don't know what somebody is 
trying to do. You you have no idea if they're trying to take your watch or they're trying to like kill you. And so unfortunately, you know, you can't sit down and really interview the person prior to the attack. So you have to just put some basic assumptions in there. And for a woman to have a, you know, I don't, I don't condone people having guns without being trained, without actually going to the range and like using that because try doing anything under, you know, in a stressful situation under duress and you're going to, you know, see how good you really are. Right. So I think it's really important that people spend time, uh, you know, fine tuning their, the responsibility it is of, of owning a handgun and caring. Um, but that would have stopped the guy, you know, for sure. Um, whether it was just pulling it out or not, I've had situations in my life where both I've, I've been carrying and I've had to, to brandish my weapon to make people not do what they were going to probably try and do and rob me. Um, and then situations where somebody was attacking another person and I used jujitsu to control that person until the cops arrived and, you know, and completely disarmed the situation. So I think it's, you know, for everybody, it's really individual. But as you said, the best thing is to not be there, right? Like, I think my life, like phrase, you know, is that I, that I always just keep in the back of my mind is like, pay attention, pay attention to everything because, you know, in life where you're walking, what you're doing, pay attention to opportunities for jobs, pay attention to your life and how easily you can lose it by not paying, you know, when you're driving, I mean, everything like just pay, pay attention. And so for somebody being out there, I'm not, you know, you never know, right. Um, what can happen, but I think, there's a way that somebody can carry themselves. There's people that are, you know, when you're walking around, you're actually looking around or are you walking through a parking garage looking at your phone, yeah. right? Yes, exactly. Like, are you, how are you carrying yourself? I mean, all these things are important, but this idea that you're going to go take one self-defense class and do some bullshit. And then like, all of a sudden the guy's like, wait, hey, hold on. This isn't how it went. I kicked <laughs> yeah. him in the groin and then he went and down. And that's like, what we were trying to that's tell That's what them. I was trying to it's explain. Like, There's like one yeah. self-defense class ain't going to do it. I brought up, uh, there was no. a cop that was, I don't remember what city she was, but she was a three-stripe white belt and she said the only reason she attacked uh, she survived this guy stabbing her and trying to kill her as a cop was because she knew the basics of self-defense she was a three-stripe white belt so she had been doing it for a little bit right you're not going to learn that motor that like motor movement and that that second nature by doing a single self-defense class right like that and i and right. that's like Self-defense classes are great to get like a very basic understanding of like a possibility of what you could do. But we, John and I are huge advocates for women, women doing jujitsu. Like I wish more women would get into it. It's kind of like you're a fit guy. I wish more women would get into like being fit. You know what I mean? Like ha being okay with having muscle, being okay with these things because it benefits them as much as it benefits us. If not more, you know what I mean? Like a woman that's jacked, Walking down the street is probably less likely to get attacked, especially if she knows jujitsu. You know what I mean? But <laughs> well, like I get a little annoyed yeah. because when they ask me about that, it's um, they want a women's self defense class, and my first thought is, well, I wish you would train against a man because if you get attacked, that's logic. That's You're getting attacked by women, right? It's very gonna, rarely, yeah. Right? So I mean, and that's what I get. They want a women's only self defense class, and I'm like. I really wish you would train against men. I, I think that would be more beneficial. I, I totally understand that. And especially with jujitsu, I understand girls wanting to train with other girls, right? Because it's very hands-on. Yeah. We have girls in our school. They train with the boys. It's not like a weird thing at all. We have we have one girl that joined because she was attacked and she was able to get away. She's a very physical girl. She was able to get away, but she was like, I don't want to ever let this, you know, happen like again and just like it be hopefully that I get away, right? right. So she's empowering herself by learning this stuff and learning these skills. So it, it's it's probably not you know, so singular, there's probably like a multifaceted approach that people could take to really be prepared. It's just that we live in such a comfortable setting every day. Yeah. Like our day-to-day -day lives are so fucking easy, man. We don't have bombs exploding over our head. We don't have crazy shit usually going on that often, you know, like for the most part, things are pretty relaxed. So if you're not walking through some, you know, dark area and like the backside of a city at two o'clock in the morning, like you're probably, you know, you're usually pretty good. So don't put yourself in shitty situations, but you know, don't, don't think that by going to some, you know, one simple self-defense class and, you know, getting a few things that you never practice that you're going to somehow be able to, you know, like 
uh, deploy those things in that in that situation. I just I don't think it happens, and and unfortunately that's why there's such an importance of 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 protecting our Second Amendment and having that man because you're not, you know, like sorry a six foot five guy against some little woman that's even a badass in jujitsu. Like who cares? They'll yeah. grab her by the neck and throw her down and hold her down. Good luck, yep. you know. And- so you you need those type of resources because there's shitty people out there, you know, and you got to be and we have to be able to protect ourselves. And that's one thing John and I mentioned too is like is like in these i'm not saying there's no value in it not, i don't want anyone listening at home that, uh, thinking that we're saying there's no value in these women's self-defense classes because any knowledge is better than no knowledge right but there is the power of jujitsu is we always implement with sparring like there is the practical application of jujitsu at the end beginning or in your off days there's the applicable applicable application of jujitsu right and you need that for even in self-defense you need to know what it feels like for someone to grab you and you having to actually (laughs) break the grip you know what i mean like because it's one thing to be in class like oh you're gonna grab it and break and you're gonna grab it and you're gonna break now if someone actually grabs you you're like it's gonna shock you like oh shit like that's actually way stronger than I freaking thought it was going to be. You know what I mean? Like there's there's the whole aspect of it that I feel like yep. you don't get from a one two day course, you know what I mean? John mentioned something that was pretty funny. He's like put a, put a guy in a red suit, a red like padded I asked suit for it the and other then day. just ask for it and like go go at him and like, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. now let's try it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, really. Yeah, I mean it's yeah, you definitely have to, and then also even with jujitsu, you know, there's competition jujitsu, and then there's self defense jujitsu. I mean, very different things. Like with the jujitsu you're going to use in MMA, when we're training for that, you know, if you're passing someone's guard or you're breaking the guard or whatever, and you also can be punched in the face, that's going to be different than competition gi jujitsu, where you know that you can put the hands on their waist and their legs, and you don't have you're not getting punched in the face. I mean, totally different things. So, um, so understanding those you know, and being able to distinguish those different things and, and, you know, training, whatever it is that that's going to be, you know, most useful for, for you is, is obviously important. But again, I just think as a life skill, self-defense is a non-negotiable, you know what I mean? Like everybody should do something to be able to protect themselves. So they're not just a blatant victim. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. What's the PSA of the day? <laughs> That was my that was my last question. I'm sorry, Travis asked me. <laughs> no, 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 I thought it was that was a great question, man. No, I, I forgot. Completely forgot we were just talking about that earlier. So, but hey, Matt, I just want to thank you so much for for coming on the show today, man. This was a blast. I think we covered a variety of topics in depth, and it was it was great, man. Thank you so much for for coming on. Thank you, guys, man. I really appreciate you guys reaching out. Absolutely, it's great connecting with yeah, you guys. Yeah, absolutely. So, if people want to follow you and find your your amazing jiu-jitsu gear the, the my favorite thing that people say is it's grappling gear by grapplers right like so where where can yeah, they yeah, find yeah. find you at so uh instagram epic roll bjj same with uh twitter and epic roll bjj.com is our uh, our website so usually always on that instagram on the gram that's right yeah and then uh what what do you have coming up that you can you can give a little sneak peek to besides the collaboration with Killcliff so people can can know what's coming up so i've got i've got uh a few really exciting athletes coming up um some stuff with yuri simones uh some stuff with uh the kill cliff i told you about um and uh we have the crow mags project that i that we recently did um my buddy harley who's a uh henzo gracie black belt um was in the Chromax, so we did a 35th anniversary uh, for his Age of Coral album. So we did a whole Rash Gargi in short. So we're going to do another collection of his Best Wishes album, and then uh, some other Chromax so fight gear. Cool. So some of that stuff, yeah, man, it's coming out. Uh, yeah, I love that guy. Um, so doing some fun stuff with them, and then you know, just letting it letting it organically happen, man. New stuff. Oh, I got we're doing. I'm doing Rash Guard with uh, with uh, Jeff Glover, so that'll be uh, coming out um, soon too, and. Uh, um so yeah all kinds of exciting stuff man cool man well thank you so much once again uh john you got anything else no man thank you very much hey guys thank you for watching at home thank you for listening and uh remember no oil checks here (laughs) thanks guys (laughs) thanks guys (laughs) 